Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of 2000's X-Men. This franchise is officially resurrecting to merge with the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Hugh Jackman's Wolverine joins Deadpool in Marvel's one film of the year 2024. So we knew we had to go back through all 13 of the Fox X-Men films for an X-Men Stick Stick Rewatch to break down new secrets and identify what elements of this franchise in which Kevin Feige got his start that he will deem worthy of bringing back in Deadpool 3. So every week, we're gonna have a fresh in-depth breakdown of each of these films, everything you missed and everything you need to know, and that includes one or two things no one really ever talks about with these films. Now, for any possible plot implications from this film to Deadpool 3 that I consider to be too much of a spoiler for anyone not following the leaks or rumors about Deadpool 3, I'm gonna delay those to a spoiler section I'm calling the Danger Room at the end of the video. And to celebrate this X-Men Stick Stick rewatch, we are doing a special X-Men themed merch release, which is really the best way to support new rock stars. Grab one of these designs by clicking the link in the description. Okay, in the opening 20th Century Fox logo, the X lingers a bit on the fade to black. They keep this going throughout the subsequent X-Men movies, and throughout this film, there are just a ton of Xs prominently and not so prominently displayed in scenes from obvious ones like uh, Charles Xavier's necktie pin and Aurora Monroe's pendant necklace to the way just window frames fold, but I just like that they set this Easter egg hunt up right here out of the gate. Now, the reason we're seeing 20th Century Fox here is that Marvel, of course, sold the film rights of the X-Men to Fox in the late 90s, but in 2019, Disney completed an acquisition of Fox's film and TV properties, which would be why they could now appear in the MCU. But five years later, why haven't we seen an X-Men movie in the MCU yet? Well, there's a specific reason that people avoid talking about that I'll get to later in this breakdown. But this franchise and its characters are near and dear to Marvel head Kevin Feige, who got his start in Marvel filmmaking as an associate producer on this film. He actually began as an assistant to executive producer Lauren Schuller Donner, one of Hollywood's most accomplished producers producers and producing partner and spouse to the great director Richard Donner, director of 1978 Superman, the superhero movie that Kevin Feige always wanted to recreate with his films. What's interesting though about Feige is that he didn't really grow up as a reader of comic books. He just loved Star Trek and Star Wars and comic book movies like Superman, but when he was assigned to this X-Men film in his early 20s, he tasked himself with reading every Marvel comic he could get his hands on and he fell in love. While director Brian Singer banned comic books from the set, Feige was the go-to comics guru and Hugh Jack and later said that he would sneak over to Feige's office to read up on Wolverine source material. And I just find that to be an interesting paradox that despite Feige's reputation as a comics nerd, he was a late convert to Marvel lore. And he didn't burn out early into like a defensive gatekeeper like a lot of guys who grew up reading comics sometimes do. He never really had that chance to become dissatisfied with where comics were going. While his tastes mature in one direction and comics pivot in another direction to appeal to changing societal interests. And so just as an adult, he just kind of fell into this trove in his adulthood and he appreciated it for what it was. And I think that specific set of circumstances is what made this movie so authentic to people who love X-Men and what would later make the Marvel Cinematic Universe so successful. But in these opening seconds, Feige's love of Star Trek must have delighted this nerd to hear Patrick Stewart open this film with the narration as Charles Xavier. Mutation. It is the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet. Now we are seeing five subatomic particles swirling, leaving these trails of stardust and randomly colliding, as we are seeing a mutant gene being activated, and the film depicts it as a cosmic event. Later on in the third act, they will use the same white tinted cosmic radiation to show how mutation can be artificially recreated. But here in these opening images, we swoop down a spinal column as light illuminates nerve endings, all parts of the body, until swooping back up in reverse into the brain, which gets locked behind a closing X door. This would be the room that houses Cerebro. I think we are beginning this whole franchise in a moment of meditation with Charles Xavier as he reflects upon the moment he was in utero and his mutant gene was activated. There's actually a specific psychic battle that Charles fought in this stage of his life in the comics that Deadpool 3 might bring up, but more on that in the Danger Room. But the X door closing with this dial lock like a bank vault would go on to be an iconic image for the X-Men franchise, a symbol of secrecy and security, having to keep these genetic traits in the closet, so to speak. Recently in Loki Season 2, the blast doors of the TV a loom observation deck were clearly influenced by this design. The next secret behind this door is the origin of Eric Lenscher, future Magneto. We see raindrops in the mud as Jewish people are marched into Auschwitz in 1944, and we linger on their dress shoes, a striking symbol for anyone who has visited the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., which includes 4,000 shoes on display of victims of the Holocaust taken from them upon their entrance to camps like these. X-Men has always told the story of bigotry and otherness. Stan Lee conceived them in the 1960s as a metaphor for 
for the civil rights movement. These movies in the early aughts were posed as metaphors for the gay rights movement. And as a victim of the Holocaust, Eric Lyncher understands that bigotry on two fronts. Young Eric notices the prisoner tattoos of the prisoners on the other side of the fence. And later on in this film, he will look down at his own tattoo, a constant reminder of mankind's capacity for cruelty and intolerance. As Eric is separated from his family and hears his mother screaming for him, he inadvertently uses his powers, forcing the gates outwards and bending them into the shape of an X. While for Charles, an X on a door is a symbol of secrecy and inner meditative illumination, X marking the spot, so to speak. For Eric Lyncher, it's a symbol of pain. On to another origin story. In Meridian, Mississippi, the not-too-distant future, Marie, who will later take up the moniker of Rogue, played by Anna Paquin in this movie, fantasizes about a post-high school trip to Canada, which is what leads her there when she runs away. She has a Statue of Liberty sticker, foreshadowing the final battle, where she will get her iconic silver hair streak. Her boyfriend goes in for a kiss, and his blood vessels bulge out of his skin as she drains the life force from his body. I love that uncertain look that Paquin gives right before the kiss, as if skin-to-skin -skin contact might have had this effect on others for her before, just on a smaller scale. In the comics, his boyfriend is identified as Cody, and this makeout session rendered him permanently comatose. But notice how, in this movie, Magneto and Rogue are the only two characters for whom we see origin stories in this movie. Not Wolverine, not Professor X, not Scott Summers, just these two characters. Because really, secretly, this movie is about these two people gradually getting closer and closer together as Magneto is hunting her down to exploit her for his own agenda. Jean Grey testifies before the US Senate explaining what we just saw. These mutations manifest at puberty and are often triggered by periods of heightened emotional stress. Jean is dressed in red, as she often is in this movie, a little nod to her eventual fiery Dark Phoenix persona, and we meet Senator Robert Kelly, who uses an anti-mutant stance to further his political career, pushing a mutant registration act. He says, I have here a list of names. Which evokes the way Senator Joe McCarthy would produce lists of names of supposed communists in the U.S. government in the 1950s. Senator Kelly goes on. Senator uh, here's Kelly. A, a girl in Illinois who can walk through walls. Obviously referring to Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat. We will see her later in this film and in X2. And the character was recast as Elliot Page for The Last Stand. Senator Kelly fear mongers that the girl could infiltrate the White House, which is a threat that manifests in the opening sequence of X2 with Nightcrawler. Senator Kelly says the American people deserve the right to know whether their children are going to school with mutants to being taught by mutants. And in the year 2000, this was a thinly veiled metaphor for the persecution of LGBT teachers, an issue that sadly keeps coming back up. Charles, watching from the gallery, turns his head, sensing Magneto's presence. Charles is the mutant Kelly was referring to, obviously, who can enter our minds, but chooses not to in this moment. Eric Lyncher is wearing a hat not unlike the one his father wore in the opening scene. And this walkway isn't like any in the actual US Capitol, but you know, neither was that Senate room. Remember, this is a not too distant future. This walkway is actually Roy Thompson Hall, a concert venue in Toronto. They're surrounded by X's all around them on the windows, as if to say, X genes are everywhere, all around us. And Eric is reflected in the glass panels of that walkway, kind of like the look of his prison at the end of the film. Charles says, Mankind has evolved since then. Yes, into us. I love the shot composition of the scene. Charles's face is illuminated in sunlight. Eric's is in shadow. Charles is represented often with the X of his wheelchair spokes in the foreground, while Eric looks small in the background. The relationship between these two characters was inspired by the one between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader who preached nonviolent resistance and legislation, as opposed to Malcolm X, who preferred change by any means necessary. Both men were necessary to further the advances of the civil rights movement. And yes, obviously, this is a philosophical debate that Ryan Coogler brought back to its racial Roots when he was staging the conflict between T'Challa and Killmonger in Black Panther. Rogue hitchhikes to Laughlin City, a fictional town in northern Alberta, Canada. This truck driver with a big walrus mustache who drops her off is George Buza, the voice of Beast in X-Men the Animated Series and a few video games. My name is Mr. McCoy. This is Laughlin City. And we meet Logan, Wolverine, Hugh Jackman. He's not quite as jacked as he would become in subsequent X-Men movies, but that's part of why we love him in this movie. He's still badass without being like, Huge! It's crazy to think that he was relatively unknown before this film. He was an Australian stage actor recommended for this role by his friend Russell Crowe after Crowe turned the role down. And this is just one of the all-time greatest Marvel hero introductions. He's an animal in a cage fight. As he fights, every time he lands a punch, we hear the metal of his adamantium underneath the skin clinking. There's even a metallic grind in the sound mix when Logan stretches his neck. Ladies 
Yeah, I thought that was his dog tags, but no, no, that is definitely his neck. Now, the bartender here is actor Doug Lennox, who actually reprises this role for X-Men The Last Stand in an alternate ending. These bar scenes were filmed inside Gooderham and Wart's Distillery in Toronto, Canada, which is actually the same location where they filmed the concentration camp scenes. The song playing in the background is Lucinda Williams' Still I Long For Your Kiss, which is about a heartbroken woman who still longs for her lover's kiss. Rogue longs for a kiss that she knows she'll never have. The coat that Logan is wearing here is actually the one he gets in X-Men Origins Wolverine from the character Travis. It's not really an Easter egg for this movie, it's an Easter egg for the later movie, but you know, continuity. Now we gotta talk about Hugh Jackman's look here. His hair was fashioned into these pointed wings with chops jutting down into his thick scruff. This is really a compromise to maintain Wolverine's iconic silhouette from the comics. It is frustratingly, in most other instances in this movie, visually, Brian Singer in the studio felt that comic accuracy would not be believable, but you could sense Kevin Feige screaming from the sidelines here to at least maintain the cigar, the dog tags, and the pointed hair. Because for a character to look like the comic book character in close-up and silhouette, at least with the facial hair, is really, at the end of the day, the most important thing, so that, you know, from a distance, or if you like squint your eyes, or if they're in a shadow backlit, they still look like the comic book hero. Now, the loser in this cage fight pulls a knife, and we see Wolverine's adamantium claws coming out for the first time. Since his own knuckle skin is getting cut here, I don't think YouTube will let us show it. TikTok definitely plugged a video I made about this. But I love this close-up of the middle claw extending delayed slowly while Hugh Jackman's eye is staring at the camera in the upper right. It's definitely a practical effect, probably made by leather or latex, but you know it's practical because you see that middle claw reflected in the metal of the claw on the right. And seeing Logan's skin tear viscerally reminds us how painful this is for him, as he says later. When they come out, does it hurt? Every time. Every time. The bartender pulls a shotgun, similar to the one that he will pull in the last stand alternate ending right before he says, I remember you. And Logan, I love this, slices through the gun in the precise spot to make the buckshot spill out, but without clipping the guy's arm. And if you look closely on the severed end of that barrel, you can see the cap still in the chamber. This move gets called back in Logan, except that time he's much less precise in his old age and he cuts the guy's arm off when slicing through the shotgun. Now it's always interesting to me how Logan retracts his claws because it's never really quite clear how he does that. But in shots of his x-rays and when Magneto White his claws on the train later, you can see little screws on the base of the claws to suggest that these were screwed and bolted into his adamantium skeleton separately. So there might be some muscle operated trigger that slides the claws back in. Now, of course, later movies in this franchise would imply that he had bone claws, but here in this movie, it's just stuff that was surgically added. Actually, years later in a 2022 episode of She-Hulk, they referenced this moment with a headline on a news website, Man with Metal Claws Fights in Bar Brawl. But it's the same kind of VFX Easter egg that Eternals defenders point to to say that the MCU has referenced him out in the ocean when it's you know just something someone threw in there that no one really saw except people who make and watch the youtube videos like this so i just don't know how much weight it has in viewers minds as proof that x-men continuity is part of the same universe as the sacred timeline mcu but for an awesome theory for how these two universes could exist together the youtube channel comics explained host rob jefferson had an amazing pitch for how in the mcu mutants and x-men once existed but professor x brainwashed all of society to forget mutants and their past wars with humanity, but Vision found out the truth, but kept it a secret. But then Thanos' snap awakened some of the mutants, and that leading to this current saga where all hell could break loose. Now I'm recapping the Twitter thread I read from him, but Rob's video and initial tweet were mysteriously deleted. I don't know, maybe Kevin Feige saw it and was like, eh, too close to what we have planned, and he had them pruned. Rob, I'm sorry if I'm accidentally putting you on blast, I just really love your theory and I wanted to shout it out. So Wolverine lets Rogue tag along, and she asks about his dog tags, which are the standard type issued by the Canadian military, and they read 45825, 243 Wolverine. We'll get their full backstory in X-Men Origins Wolverine. Our breakdown coming week four. It's gonna be a lot of fun. His truck crashes into a felled tree and Rogue witnesses his regenerative healing powers. This is an attack by Sabretooth, played by professional wrestler Tyler Maine and recast as Leif Schreiber for X-Men Origins. Storm and Cyclops save them from the exploding truck. They escape and we meet Toad, played by Darth Maul actor Ray Park. After the depiction of Toad in this movie, most post-2000 comic adaptations of Toad were drawn to look like Ray Park. He's seen at first with goggles on making his eyes appear much larger, like a toad. This metal piece that he is spray painting here is the piece of the Statue of Liberty that they later used to hide Magneto's conversion device. Now, these metal balls on Magneto's Newton's cradle aren't supported by strings. He's just using his powers to move them. But I like to think about the amount of concentration required for Magneto to give into gravity just enough to replicate the swinging motion. And by the way, for a movie so concerned with grounded realism when it comes to the costumes, the production obviously didn't mind going full 90s Batman when it comes to Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants Island layer with sets like this i don't think we would have minded yellow and blue spandex magneto says i have made the first move 
That is all they know. As we will see in the final scene, this is all one big game of chess between Eric and Charles. Logan springs awake, frightening Jean Grey, and we are in the X-Mansion basement with its shiny blue and gray surfaces and its X doors looking just as it does when it's recreated for the Marvel's post credit scene. Charles telepathically directs Wolverine to the elevator and through the ground floor of the mansion. Indeed, this is a chess match. Charles is moving his pieces around the board as much as Eric Lencher is. Logan enters Charles' office where he's teaching a smaller class that includes a few familiar young mutants that don't get called out by their monikers in this film, and most of them get recast for sequels. But there is Shadowcat Kitty Pride. She's the one who runs through the door. Iceman Bobby Drake, that's Sean Ashmore's character. This movie's Pyro, we'll talk about him later. Mirage Danielle Moonstar, who later gets played by Blue Hunt in 2020's The New Mutants. And this movie's Jubilee on the far left. And take a look at that chalkboard. Charles has drawn some diagrams about the nature of perception and the way light reflects off objects. Now, I used to think that this was a visual nod of the way Cyclops will angle his optic blast in the final battle, like refracting it through his lens at an angle like that, but the deeper detail is actually way more interesting. As Charles assigns the essays, listen closely. I'd like your definitions of weak and strong anthropic principles on my desk on Wednesday. He says he wants them to write about weak and strong anthropic principles. So what does that mean? The anthropic principle basically says that you can only take into account things you are able to see as opposed to what you're unable to see because what you're unable to see will bias your opinion of that thing because you're not basing it off of any kind of objective perception. So strong versus weak. The weak anthropic principle states that you observe the universe as having the right conditions for you to exist, because if it had different conditions, you would not exist to observe that. The strong anthropic principle states that either there are an infinite number of universes, or our universe is infinitely large with slightly different parameters slash conditions and laws of physics, and human observers are only present to observe where the conditions of this universe permit them to exist. So the weak principle is actually assumed to be correct, but when it comes to the world of movies, with things like the multiverse saga, in which the MCU is merging with an alternate X-Men universe, movies definitely use the strong principle. So all the way back here, 24 years ago, in the year 2000, Charles Xavier is acknowledging the existence of the multiverse, which makes it really cool in the post credit scene of the Marvels when Beast indicates that Charles asked for an update about a multiversal traveler who came into this universe from a rift. This whole time that we've seen him, this guy is thinking about the multiverse. Charles formally introduces Logan to Scott Summers, Cyclops, played by James Marsden, and Aurora Monroe, Storm, played by Halle Berry. Now, Halle Berry uses a Kenyan accent here that she will drop in subsequent films. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? At a school for people like us. Both characters actually had scripted scenes that were cut from the film. Aurora was accidentally gonna destroy her hometown in Kenya with her powers. Scott, we were gonna see destroying his high school bathroom. These two scenes were not shot for the film, but Scott's origin was obviously eventually seen in X-Men Apocalypse when he's played by Ty Sheridan. And I think it says something about how good this movie was, in which pretty much all the leads in the cast you could see being A-lister stars in movies today. Hugh Jackman, James Marsden, Halle Berry, Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, Anna Paquin, Sean Ashmore, Famke Jansen, Rebecca Romaine. Like these people just didn't disappear from Hollywood. Now, Logan tells them that he doesn't need medical attention and Charles is like, yes, of course, because he knows that part of Logan's abilities is rapid healing. Now, Scott holds out his hand to shake Logan's, but it's denied. And I just love that we see that animosity right off the bat between these two characters because it just wouldn't feel right to have an X-Men movie where these two were like best friends. And I just noticed a really fun detail here. When Jean Grey passes by, Logan totally checks her out and Scott notices this. You could see him turning his head like, dude, bro, Logan hates that they all have nicknames. And he tells Charles, what do they call you? Wheels, which is actually an ad lib from Hugh Jackman. The original script had him saying, what do they call you, Baldy? And remember, the Burger King Kids Club did have a member in a wheelchair whose nickname was Wheels. Ah, the 90s, folks. But I like that this movie doesn't shy away from Charles calling them Storm and Cyclops and Magneto. Like the MCU would do away with superhero monikers, at least in the early phases. And I just think it's time they came back. It's what I'm most looking forward to from the multiverse saga and the mutant saga. During Charles's monologue about the school, we get a quick appearance by this character who's sketching by the pond. This is actually Peter Rasputin, AKA Colossus. Donald McCann Kenan plays him here. Daniel Cudmore will play him in X2. We see a kid cheating at basketball by using his teleportation powers. And obviously this isn't Nightcrawler. Another kid shouts at him, hey, no powers. And we're seeing just a core tenet of Xavier's school is to teach young mutants to hone their powers, but to avoid using them to cut corners. And I believe this kid with glasses is the same kid with glasses who will later look out the window and see the jet flying out of the basketball court thinking, wow, I could have accidentally teleported down into a jet basement. And we see Storm lecturing about the Roman Empire. See, Hollywood is to blame for men thinking about the Roman Empire at least once per Day. Now we only see the chalkboard here in this scene with Roman Empire written on it and also Emperor Constantine, but in a deleted scene, her lecture goes into more detail. The Roman Empire. For centuries, they persecuted and ostracized the Christians. Then, almost overnight, their religion rose to become the dominant faith of the empire. 
Does anyone know what suddenly caused the Christians to become accepted? The emperor became Christian? Exactly right. Emperor Constantine and his ruling class all converted. She's referring to a transitional period in which the persecuted Christians of Rome grew in number and converted Constantine in order to flip Rome's political and social structure to their favor. And Christianity, of course, would go on to dominate the Western world. Obviously, this is very similar to Magneto's plan to convert Senator Kelly and then all the world leaders in New York into mutants so that that pro-mutant sentiment will trickle down through society. And I just like how in the sequence, by paying attention to the chalkboards of Aurora and Charles, in a way, the whole final act of the film is set up. If you're looking to ring in the new year by ringing in a new you, revamping your daily hygiene routine is the best place to start and Geology is here to help your New Year's resolutions with new skincare solutions. Geology is a 29 time award winning skin, hair and body care company recognized in Men's Health, Oprah Daily, Hypebeast, Birdie, Esquire and GQ. Geology's products use just like a handful of powerful proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Geology can help you fight acne, reduce oilness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother hydrated skin and target signs of aging. I mean, is it really a new year if you don't age? I don't think so. If you don't know where to start, Geology can create a simple and effective skincare or hair care routine for you. All you got to do is take a quick 30 second quiz. Right now, if you use code NEWROCKSTARS100, Geology will give you 100% off their award winning skincare trial set. You'll also get an additional bonus offer of up to 30% off one skin, hair, or body product when you add it to your trial. So 100% off plus an additional 30% off. Hope you save some champagne because this is a deal worth celebrating. Click the link in the description or go to G-E-O-L-O-G dot I-E slash Rockstars 100 to get started. A student named John tries to impress Rogue by making a ball of fire, which Bobby then freezes. Aaron Stanford were going to play Pyro in X2 and X-Men The Last Stand, but an actor named Alex Burton plays him here. Burton was a young day player who worked with a few of Brian Singer's associates at DEN, Digital Entertainment Network, which was a precursor to YouTube that Brian Singer was affiliated with. Despite having no credits, Burton was flown from LA to Toronto to play this role, and the role ended up being cut down in the final version of the movie, but this takes a dark turn here. He sued three of Brian Singer's associates claiming that he was sexually assaulted and held against his will. This lawsuit was joined by two other former Den employees and they were awarded $6 million, but it was never paid. Burton changed his name and never appeared in another film. Anytime I watch this movie, I see this guy and his erasure just really bums me out. But it's important to talk about because the dark shadow Brian Singer and his associates cast over this film and the whole film industry, everybody who enabled them is something that we can never forget. Just spend some time I'm Googling Brian Singer, there are so many accounts over the years of sexual assault and intimidation, all kinds of horrible things. I broke down an investigation that Marvel's X-Men delays might be due to legacy producers like Brian Singer contractually obligated to payouts and credits for any future films with quote X-Men in the title. That is for better or worse how this industry works. So I just think we cannot sweep this under the rug. It's continuing to plague Hollywood in all kinds of ways. It's okay to still like this movie and appreciate the good things about it, but there is always more to the story that we cannot forget. So Sean Ashmore plays Bobby, AKA Iceman here after playing Jake in a short-lived Nickelodeon Animorph series. He will go on to play Lamplighter in The Boys, a character who has pyro powers. His twin brother, Aaron Ashmore actually played Jimmy Olsen in Smallville. Senator Kelly's motorcade passes signs reading mutants are killers, human rights, Rights, protect our children. And also this one, send the mutants to the moon forever. Now the moon in Marvel lore is the home to the Inhumans, which is actually created by Marvel in order to get around the X-Men film rights issues. Like you may remember in the 2010s, Marvel CEO Ike Perlmutter was like pushing Inhumans and humans and even made Kamala Khan an Inhuman, even though they wanted to make her a mutant so that they could make film adaptations out of the Inhumans and not mutants. And since all of these are now under the Disney umbrella, that's why they made Kamala Khan a mutant in Ms. Marvel. Also, we should point out in the comics, the X-Men also also set up a lunar compound near the blue area of the moon. Now, Senator Kelly's aide is Henry Gyrich, which is the name of a big character from Marvel Comics, someone who goes up against the Avengers even, but Magneto later reveals that Mystique has been playing the long game. Mr. Gyrich has been dead for some time, Senator. And in the film's final minutes, if you listen closely, there's a news report that explains what happened to the real Gyrich. In a related story, the body of Senator Robert Kelly's longtime aide, Henry Gyrich, was found today. Larry Carter's reports seem to indicate Gyrich was mauled by a bear. Mauled by a bear implies that this is probably Sabretooth's doing. Henry is wearing a blue and yellow tie, and when we see him in the background behind Kelly, a blue lens flare reflects off his face in the sunlight, setting up this transition to the blue-skinned, yellow-eyed Mystique, played by Rebecca Romaine.
composer Michael Kamen used a cello for Mystique's theme for its fierceness and eroticism. Hans Zimmer and Tina Guo later applied the same principle using the electric cello for the iconic Wonder Woman theme. I gotta say, the Mystique's shape-shifting in this movie holds up, despite her skin, you know, looking a bit rubbery smooth, like PlayStation quality if you pause on it, but the motion of it looks great because they decided to add these scales or feather-like pieces. They're about three inches long and they fold and unfold, so it kind of looks like a reptile or a fish shifting in the light so that their scales catch the light differently, or maybe a bird ruffling their feathers. Compare that to the transition of the Skrulls in the MCU, or even the Shi'ar in Dark Phoenix, where they try to show the shape shifting on a more granular level to make it more smooth and sleek, but by doing that they just make it more subtle and it's less of a spectacle. But I point this out because VFX technology getting better and better and more refined doesn't always make it look cooler to viewers. Sometimes the old way is better. Jean Grey examines Wolverine, giving him an x-ray scan, and we learn about his healing powers and his adamantium skeleton. The x-ray, if you look closely, implies that the claws and sheaths were actually added to his exoskeleton, as opposed to how in later films Logan had bone claws that Weapon X grafted the adamantium to. And I like how the x-ray of his skull shows the adamantium plating in a very specific pattern, which I think might be this film's way of explaining why Logan's hair points that specific way. Charles says, Experimentation on mutants. It's not unheard of. But I've never seen anything like this before. Now, later on in X-Men First Class, we see a younger Charles and a younger Eric briefly encountering Logan in the early 60s, leading to one of the all-time best cameos. Go f*** yourself. But how much Charles actually knows about him here, at this point, is just unclear. Because when they made this movie, they didn't know that, like, 11 years later, Matthew Bond was going to be doing that scene. Magneto's machine uses his powers to harness this goofy CGI light to irradiate the whole compound that recalls the light that we saw in the swirling particles in the opening imagery. Now, if Marvel Studios ever wanted to, they could use this as a kind of predicate to say cosmic radiation can turn people into mutants or activate a mutant gene in any dormant mutants. That way, that could tie in Thanos' snap that released a universe-wide blast of cosmic radiation as a way to create an MCU mutant awakening. While flirting, Jean Grey reads Logan's mind and she sees flashes of the Weapon X program and everything that William Stryker did to Logan. And I like how back in that memory, Logan's eyes open in that tank, as if back in that moment in the 80s, he sensed Jean looking into his mind. I bring this up because Days of Future Past establishes the existence in this X-Men continuity of consciousness-based time travel, in which Kitty Pride can project one's consciousness into the body of their past selves. So if Kitty could do that, why not the future Phoenix? Now, I'm not saying the 2000 film intended intended this moment to be that, but you know, I just like to think that in my head canon it could be possible. But we can also interpret this moment as Gene awakening Wolverine's trauma for him, because it's not like he spent the first act of this movie actively thinking about it. It could have been buried in his subconscious. Maybe even the Phoenix Force is drawing Wolverine back into the darkness. It just didn't seem like Logan seemed to be vividly haunted by these memories until this moment when Gene read it in his mind. So that's why later this same night he returns through his memories to that Alkali Lake lab where observers are passing glasses of champagne. And I like this detail because it tells us that he was awake for the entire procedure. Wolverine stabs Rogue and she borrows his regenerative powers to heal. The way Paquin plays it is just so breathless and shocking we forget that she has this power and can heal herself. I remember as a kid watching the scene being like, oh, she's dead. And afterwards she tells Storm, it was an accident. And I like that. It could apply both to what she did, grabbing his face, and what he did to her. Like she's defending Logan in this moment. Now I might be overthinking this, but if you look at the big picture of the plot here, it really is Rogue who Magneto is targeting. So on a cosmic level, Logan was unconsciously following a soldier's instinct to take away the one weapon Magneto would need. I know Logan didn't want to stab this girl that he's trying to protect, but this movie is all about sacrifice and removing pieces off the chessboard. Magneto struts out to Senator Kelly's cell on a walkway that he forms out of this metallic plates that fly up into place right before he steps on them. The prison that he will be contained within at the end of the film will use the same kind of collapsible walkway just made out of plastic. Senator Kelly has been transformed into a mutant with jellyfish-like flesh and he emerges naked on a beach passing this hot dog vendor a non-speaking Stan Lee cameo. This is actually his first appearance in a Marvel movie after appearing in many Marvel TV shows and having his cameo in Blade Cut. He also obviously had a cameo in 1995's Small Rats, but that's just, you know, a cool movie, not necessarily a Marvel movie. And also this guy in a plaid shirt on the beach is the director Gary Goddard, the director of the 1987 Masters of the Universe film. And like Brian Singer has his own list of sexual assault allegations. I know, I know guys. Now at the start of this scene, Bobby shames Rogue for using her powers and tells her to leave the school and never come back. But <gasps> yellow eyes, it's Mystique. This is the first of many instances in this franchise when Mystique will impersonate others, but then flash her yellow eyes as kind of a wink to camera, even though it would risk exposing her masquerade to anyone nearby who just happens to be watching this person. It's a very silly thing, but you know, it's just kind of a fun wink that these movies always do. Charles takes him into Cerebro and the door scans his eye, giving us another X reflection in his pupil. Now, when he uses Cerebro, it's always interesting to me to see how many mutants he passes through and how most of them are middle-aged. 
age. Like, all of them are older than the students and the teachers at Xavier's school. It's just a reminder that many mutants in this world have already been living in the shadows for several generations and might not even be aware that they possess the mutant gene. Wolverine finds Rogue on the train, and she says this really interesting line. The first boy I ever kissed ended up in a coma for three weeks. I can still feel him inside my head it's the same with you. I can still feel him inside my head. Such an interesting idea, right? Like when Rogue absorbs someone's life force, she stores a small part of them inside of her mind. It's kind of like how the mutant Legion's powers work. He stores a whole community, a whole legion of identities or alters inside of his mind. Now at this train station, this little boy smiles up at Cyclops. Unlike the similar sweet moment in Captain America Winter Soldier when the boy recognizes Cap in the museum, this kid's mom pulls her son away from that scary mutant. This moment actually wasn't initially scripted. The kid that they had on set was just a huge X-Men fan and wouldn't stop grinning up at James Marsden, who during one take looked down and smiled back at the kid and they ended up keeping it in the movie. Sabretooth chokes Storm while Toad snatches Cyclops' eyepiece so that he blows a hole in the roof that Storm is able to use to fire a bolt of lightning at Sabretooth. Toad tells him to stop playing around, but it was really Toad's move that gave Storm access to the sky. Though later, I really like the detail that Toad is wearing Cyclops' eyepiece on his head, kind of like a new pair of sunglasses. I suppose he was just jealous of Sabretooth wearing Wolverine's dog tags as a trophy and one on one of his own. Magneto peels open in the train car, and for the first time in this film, he floats in with this movie's version of a supervillain attire, cape, and psionic blocking helmet. And because he is not initially lit, he's just lit from behind, again we see an example of how the silhouette is the most important thing. You just have to have that helmet. Magneto widens Wolverine's claws, which always felt so painful to me, even though I don't have adamantium claws. I can just feel that pain in his knuckles. And Magneto drops this film's great midpoint twist. What the hell do you want with me? You. What the fuck? Whoever said I wanted you. And he flings Logan back through the car. And I love the little detail of all the taller passengers ducking down in their seats so that they don't get decapitated by these claws. Magneto pulls the guns out of the cops' hands and aims them back at them. This trope of using powers to turn cops against one another, redirect their guns, is something that we see in superhero shows like Jessica Jones, WandaVision, Gen B, a slew of others. In WandaVision, it's actually Magneto's daughter from the comics, Wanda Maximoff, who did it. But in all of these, this one might be the most wild because Magneto actually fires one of the guns and he lets that bullet slowly screw into the cop's forehead as he screams in pain. It just demonstrates that Magneto isn't afraid to pull the trigger and there are far more creative and devastating things that Magneto can do with a single bullet. Like he doesn't need a full armory of guns, just a single bullet that he could yaka arrow through everyone's heads and kill them. Eric knows that Charles's weakness is that he isn't willing to kill him or let innocent people die and he calls his bluff, giving Eric the upper hand. This helmet obviously blocks Charles's powers which we find out in first class was actually something he got from Sebastian Shaw. Senator Kelly shows up at the X-Mansion, but his body is rejecting the mutation and he bursts like a water balloon with a disgusting squelching noise. <laughs> This is what would actually happen to all the normal humans that Magneto tried to irradiate into mutants. If he was successful, a lot of world diplomats' homes would just get flood damage. On Liberty Island, D.B. Sweeney cameos as this waving park guard. He was actually one of the actors considered for the role of Cyclops. There's also cameos from Tom DeSanto, the film's co-writer and executive producer. And later on, the film's other co-writer, David Hater, plays the guard who finds Mystique in disguise and says, hey, this one's alive. The X-Men suit up. Do you actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? yellow spandex. They would have been totally fine wearing blue and yellow spandex. And actually, the first time the actors wore these leather suits on set, they had a hell of a time moving in them. And just so them hopping over the ledge on Liberty Island was a real challenge. We saw variations of the comics and animated series blue and gold uniforms in X-Men First Class, but Deadpool 3 will finally give us Wolverine's yellow suit in live action. Wolverine sets off the metal detector and hilariously flips off Scott using only his middle adamantium claw. Right behind Scott, you can see Mystique hiding in plain sight as the smaller Statue of Liberty before we get the close-up of the eyes turning yellow. And then after Wolverine disappears behind a column, there's a really subtle visual detail in the background where after he goes up on his own, you can see the exact moment that Mystique behind a different column shapeshifts into Wolverine when her arm juts out of the shadows right before she, as Wolverine, approaches the others to try to trick them. So Wolverine and fake Wolverine fight and the real one gains the upper hand because his adamantium claws are real and can slice through the copies. So Mystique, as Wolverine screams because they are really part of her flesh. I love that Hugh Jackman had to react the way Mystique would have to that pain. There's another solid metallic ping when Mystique kicks his gut. 
but I love that the tables turn when Mystique reverts to her natural form. She's a far more comfortable fighter against Logan that way. Actually, Kiwi Kwan from Everything Everywhere All at Once in Loki Season 2, Short Round from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, was one of the stunt coordinators on this film. Footage of him helping with the scene recently resurfaced, much to everyone's delight. Now, it's both awesome that he worked on this movie and kind of a bummer, because throughout the 90s, he struggled to get acting roles. He was really typecast, but he was able to still be part of some of our favorite films. And the fact that finally, 20 years later, Kwan was one of the stars of Loki Season 2 made his career trajectory even more interesting. So as Toad, Ray Park shows off his amazing fighting skills and twirls his pipe at one point, like a staff, obviously a self-homage to his work as Darth Maul. And then there is this infamously cringy moment. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. But I always love singling out this line because there's actually a holdover line from an earlier script that was written by Joss Whedon. The punchline wasn't meant to be delivered dramatically. But rather, it was just kind of a shrug, like, you know, a joke that Whedon would write for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But I just find this to be an interesting relic from Marvel's early years, because obviously Whedon would be a huge part of the language and tone and humor of the MCU with 2012's Avengers. And you could totally imagine, like, Tony Stark saying this as Thor was powering up Mjolnir. But, you know, Storm isn't the character that you give these kind of jokes to. She's always the one who's screaming at the sky, bellowing, speaking in heightened dialogue. And she's always just very sincere. That's what we love about Storm. So I think this miscue is important to point out and it's clearly going to be something everyone involved with these movies in the future of Marvel Cinema will learn from. When to make jokes and when to be sincere. But Wolverine isn't fooled by fake Storm and he stabs her, causing her to morph back into Mystique. I like this moment. She's cycling through different features as her ability goes out of control. Storm's white eyes shift to Mystique's yellow eyes. Storm's hand turns into Wolverine's adamantium claws, which retract back into Mystique's skin. And we know that that hurts every time, so that must have hurt her skin to do that. And then she finally collapses. Now we get the only other exchange to survive from the Joss Whedon Draft. Hey, hey, it's me. Prove it. You're a dick. Okay. Up in the head of Statue of Liberty, Magneto pins the team against the metal. And when Magneto flies and lifts Rogue's handcuffs, notice how the VFX artist added these little wave effects so that we can see his powers in action. I suppose they just didn't want it to look like Magneto can just fly like Superman can. He's just using magnetism to lift himself. It's fun to watch a final battle of a Marvel movie take place on the Statue of Liberty because years later, Spider-Man No Way Home would do the same thing. It's just a fun set piece. Wolverine frees himself by stabbing his own chest with his claws and he fights Sabretooth on the ground and he swings around the spike in a move that Marvel would later used for Black Panther. Wolverine nearly falls, but he catches up with Sabretooth before he tries to kill Storm, and he says, Hey, Bob, I'm not finished with you yet. Bob, that's just what Wolverine calls people, and I love that they gave him this line in this movie, because those little details David Hayter and Kevin Feige just knew needed to be part of Wolverine in this movie. Magneto has activated his machine using Rogue, and they debate how to stop it. The rings are moving too fast. Just shoot it. I'll kill her. Storm, can you get me up there? I can't control it like that. You could fly right over the torch. Then let me go. I totally appreciate Cyclops' leadership skills in this first film. They kind of got away from that in future films. But Logan volunteering is also his way of trumping it. Like, he's basically saying, I'm heavier than you, bub, which would make him more stabilized in the strong winds. I think also Logan wants Jean's telekinetic grip on his ass, not Scott's. Despite this, Wolverine nearly wipes out, giving Rogue her signature silver streak in her hair, which, if you think about it, is Rogue's way of keeping a piece of Magneto inside of her. And Scott still takes command of the situation and takes his clear shot at Magneto when he gets one. Wolverine's most heroic act then is not just clawing through everything, it's lending more of his regenerative powers to revive Rogue. So in the epilogue of the movie, Charles tells Logan about an abandoned military compound at Alkali Lake in the Canadian Rockies, so Logan steals the motorcycle again and heads off to investigate. Mystique takes over Senator Kelly's identity and publicly backs down for the Mutant Registration Act. Hilariously, they pause the broadcast and Mystique's yellow eyes are revealed in the pause screen, so I guess just like Zabruderine, any footage of Mystique would reveal her to real identity. Identity, but also notice that he's wearing a yellow and blue tie, which is an inverse of the one Mystique wore as his aide Henry. We end with Magneto in his metal-free prison made out of glass and plastic in this old man chess match with Charles. The two actually foreshadow some of the events of the films that come after. Doesn't it ever wake you in the middle of the night? The feeling that someday they will pass that foolish law come for you and your children. I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul who comes to that school looking for trouble. X-Men Apocalypse will end by referencing this same exchange. Doesn't it ever wake you up in the middle of the night, the feeling that one day they'll come for you and your children? 
I feel a great swell of pity for the poor soul that comes to my school looking for trouble. Now, years later, US Grandmaster Robert Hess actually analyzed Charles and Eric's specific moves in the end game of this chess match for the 538 website. And the strategies and tactics they're using in their moves actually reflect their ideologies. So Charles is represented as the character with black pieces. Eric is represented as a character with white pieces. And notice how Charles is down a queen in several other pieces, but he wins by being hyper aggressive. He forces a checkmate in just four moves and he relies mostly on his pawns. This reflects the way, especially in future films, Charles is more willing than Eric to sacrifice the mutants on his side. And he does it in a way that's not always so noble. Sacrifice will be a key theme in this franchise. And notice how earlier in this movie, Cyclops was totally willing to risk sacrificing Rogue and Logan to take out Magneto. And Jean Grey, moments after that, catches her breath as if some greater power deep inside her is telling her that she may be the next one who has to say, when I make my move the queen will take me and then you're free to check the king logan it's not you that's gotta go on i know it not me not scott you okay i'm getting away from that cringy moment to the danger room where we're gonna discuss some possible deadpool 3 spoilers so if you don't want to think about deadpool 3 you're welcome to stop watching this video okay first detail the 20th century fox logo what a fun image to open this movie with because it is the iconic image from all x-men movies and deadpool 3 seems to be bringing it back as a literal set piece a crumbling version of this studio logo in a void-esque scrapyard that deadpool and wolverine are gonna fight on top of okay let's talk about charles's psychic battle as a baby later comics would establish that charles had a twin sister in the womb Cassandra Nova, whom baby Charles would battle and defeat with the psychic blast, but Cassandra would survive and later come back to haunt him. Cassandra Nova is rumored to be the role Emma Corrin is playing in Deadpool 3. We could be seeing Charles reflecting back on that baby battle here in the opening seconds of X-Men 2000. Okay, that covers everything for the first X-Men film. And by the end of the series, I will rank every single one of these 13 movies in quality. But I can say this movie holds up. It's a lot of fun. And the success of this movie and the success of Blade from 1998 would set the stage for every Marvel movie that would come after. After it. If those movies were not successful, we would not have a Sam Raimi Spider-Verse. We would not have an MCU. So next week will be our breakdown of the sequel to this film, X2, X-Men United from 2003. A huge thanks to Gina Ippolito for her help writing this breakdown. You can support new rock stars with some X-Men inspired merch. Website in the description. Follow me on all social platforms at EA Voss and subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Stick, stick. Bye.